Hey, what's up everybody? It is Mr. Boylan, back for some more chemistry fun. In this video, we are going to explain the difference between collisions that convert reactants to products and those that do not in terms of energy distributions and molecular orientation. Breaking it down as always, we are going to one, describe the necessary conditions for a successful collision between molecules. Dose. We are going to explain the concepts of an activated complex and activation energy and relate these terms to an energy profile. Tres. Un, dos, trois. We are going to describe how surface area and temperature affect the number of successful collisions in a reaction. All right, so first of all, in order to have a reaction, molecules must collide with each other. However, they can't just collide. They have to collide with sufficient energy, what we call activation energy, which is just the energy barrier that must be overcome before a reaction can take place. Oftentimes, we'll describe this idea in an energy profile. As you look at the original potential energy of our reactants, before they can react to form products, they must have a certain amount of energy, activation energy, for the reaction to proceed from reactants to products. And two, reactant molecules must collide with a specific geometry or orientation to allow the rearrangement of reactant bonds into product bonds. Let's take a look at this thriller of an animation. This animation illustrates the reaction between element A and compound BC. Remember that there are two conditions that must be met, the required amount of activation energy and the correct orientation. So let me fire this reactant element A at the compound with relatively little energy. Okay, so the particles collided. However, they didn't collide with sufficient activation energy in order for the reaction to proceed and form products. So we still have our two reactant molecules. Let's try again. Greater amount of energy. Whoa. Notice now that I've set my launcher so that element A will have enough activation energy to react with compound BC. Boom. Collided with enough energy, formed our products. Successful collision. Success. However, keep in mind that in addition to having the correct amount of or sufficient activation energy, they also must collide with the correct orientation. So I'm gonna load this sucker with enough energy to overcome that activation energy barrier. However, this time, I'm gonna shoot it at a different angle. Boom! You can do it, you can do it, collide! Boom! So notice that this was an unsuccessful collision despite the fact that our element A had enough activation energy because they didn't collide in the correct orientation. Check out the thrilling image that's on your screen and in your notes that also drives home this idea. In order for the compound NOCl to form nitrogen monoxide and chlorine, they have to react with the correct orientation. In this case, with the two chlorine atoms colliding with one another. Any other orientation will not result in the formation of the products. So again, successful or effective collisions are those that have both the sufficient energy, activation energy, and the correct orientation to allow them to produce product in order for reaction to happen. Unsuccessful collisions are those that lack sufficient activation energy and or the correct orientation, and therefore they do not lead to a reaction. So both conditions must be met in order for a successful collision to occur. And lastly, keep in mind that in most reactions, only a small percentage of the collisions are effective collisions. Next, let's talk about the activated complex. This is a chemical species with partial bonds and is the structure at the maximum energy point along the reaction path. And so we can define the activation energy also as the difference in energy between the reactants and that activated complex. Now, take a look at the image on your screen and in your notes. You're provided with the energy profile for the reaction between two molecules of BrNO to form the products NO and bromine. The activated complex is represented here at the peak of your energy profile. It's here that the bonds between bromine and nitrogen begin to weaken and the bonds between the two atoms of bromine begin to form. Notice that those are represented by dashed or dotted lines. Now let's talk about a couple of factors that are related to collision theory. One, increasing the surface area of a solid reactant can increase the rate by increasing the number of collisions. Take a look at this thrilling image that's on your screen. On the one side, you've got a solid reactant in blue 
glue that's all stuck together, very small surface area. So the surrounding red reactant particles can only attack or react on that small outside surface area. But by crushing it up into smaller pieces, which is what you see on the other side of your screen, it enables the other red reactant to attack, react with the solid blue component over a greater area and therefore react more quickly. Increasing the rate, less tortoise, more hair. Two, increasing the concentration of reactants increases the amount of reactants colliding with one another, thus yielding product more quickly. Let's take a look at this thrilling reaction again. Very low concentrations of my reactants, not a whole lot of collisions that occur between those two reactants. Therefore, the rate of this reaction is very slow. I haven't even formed any product yet. Boom. Notice what happens when we bump up the concentrations. Lots more collisions, much greater chance that we're gonna have some reactant particles that are colliding with the correct orientation and correct amount of energy, therefore we're producing more product. Three, recognize that a rise in temperature will increase the average kinetic energy of the particles thus allowing more collisions between reactants. All right, now let's take a look at this generalized reaction that occurs between element A and compound BC. I'm gonna start us off at a very low temperature. Notice my particles are moving very slowly. Not a lot of effective collisions. Not a lot of product formation. Heat them up, speed them up. <laughs> Boom, check them out now. They're flying around like crazy. A lot more effective collisions, the formation of a lot more product. Heat them up, speed them up. Heat them up, speed them up. Heat them up, speed them up. The overall result is to increase the rate of the reaction. As you increase the temperature, as you increase the average kinetic energy of the particles, of your reactant particles, the number of reactant particles that possess the required activation energy also increases. Take a look at this thriller of a graph to help illustrate how increasing the temperature increases the number of particles with the activation energy. T1 represents our colder temperature. T2 represents our hotter temperature. This dashed line represents the activation energy. Notice that at colder temperatures, far fewer molecules far fewer particles have the required activation energy to form products. But by increasing the temperature, we increase the number of particles that meet that minimum activation energy barrier. All right, and that's it for this video. Have a fantastic day. Heat them up, speed them up, heat them up, speed them up.